Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sophieast, the podcast where we take you through some of the major topics facing importers and manufacturers in China today. Hello, listener. Thanks for joining us here on China Manufacturing Decoded. You're listening to episode 51. Adrian from Sophieast here, and I'm joined as ever by our CEO Renault. And this week we're discussing nine things that smaller importers may not be able to negotiate with. Chinese and Southeast Asian suppliers, and of course, why that might be the case. Renault, thanks for joining me. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, fine, thanks, fine. Finally, over here in Europe, things are、uh, seem to be、uh, improving a little bit. So,、uh, I'm looking forward to that with a hopeful attitude as we coming into spring as well. <laughs> yes, and here really nothing is changing.、It's、still、um, on the on the China side. No problem. Most people don't、mm. want to ask and everything. On the Hong Kong side, people are not very enthusiastic about taking the vaccine, and、um, you know, still everybody still needs a working visa or something like that to to go into China. All the foreigners, anyway. So, not much influx into、uh, into China. Not, yeah,、um, yeah. Plus, plus、long. the long the long quarantine period as well. Yes, yes, not very attractive to.、Uh, no, no,、uh, everything's still got to be、uh, remote at the moment. Although, hopefully, as as the、um, situation evolves, the Chinese authorities will accept people who have been vaccinated abroad.、Uh, that's what they say they are going to do. Yes, they,、mm. but not not immediately. They say probably the BioNTech in July, and you know, little by little they will do that. Yeah, but I guess they will also request. Reciprocity for their own vaccines.、Uh, let Let's see. Let's see. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that that would make sense, I suppose, for Chinese people who are actually going to go outside as well. But there's some hope now that、uh, you know, if you do need to get over to China, perhaps it might be possible this year a, a little bit more easily. Yeah, sometime this year. I. Yeah, let's see. I want、yeah. to <laughs> be optimistic. <laughs> right. Well, fingers crossed. So today's topic. What can't small importers negotiate with Chinese and Southeast Asian suppliers? So that could be from countries like Vietnam, which is popular, for instance. I guess first of all, it's important to define what is a small importer.、Hmm. Right. Well, it's always relative, right? It's always relative to the size of the supplier. I mean, I remember talking to some clients and you know, and, and doing some some. <laughs> Some、uh, due diligence into their suppliers, and some some of them were working with literally, you know,、uh, a tiny workshop. Of, I don't know. It was like a garage with,、uh, or a couple of garages with, you know, six people、mm. uh, doing. I don't know some、um, putting some jewelry together or, or or things like that. And in that case, you are a significant customer、uh, pretty fast, right?、Mm. Um, and of course, if you if you work with a manufacturing facility of ten thousand people, you know you and and、um, especially if it's highly、uh, automated and they, they they have very high output, well, it's it's kind of hard to be a big customer of theirs, right? So it is relative. However, let's say you buy, you know, when you you place an order, it is ten thousand dollars or Or fifty thousand dollars, but but no 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 more than that. This usually in China is considered a small buyer. Right. Okay. So,、uh, so when we're looking at really big buyers, then you you're looking in the millions, maybe even more. Oh,、um, yeah.、Um, a big buyer is a buyer that yeah that that buys you know ten million dollars a year of that、yeah. specific product. That starts to be, you know, yeah.、Uh, Could say a big buyer. Yeah.、Mm, okay. So the focus then is on the smaller businesses, and、uh, there are a number of points that、uh, it's difficult for these、uh, this size of organisation to negotiate. So、um, if you can kick it off with the first one, that is、uh, negotiating with large contract manufacturers in many countries. Right. So it's funny because the the press, you know. It's always looking at what the really big guys are doing,、um, and thinking of all the all the 
smaller buyers looking at that, you know, what exactly are they, are they learning from that? Um, you know, can they go to these huge Taiwanese contract manufacturers can, or Korean or, you know, uh, can, can they go to these guys and talk and, and, and say, hey, yeah, uh, you know, let's reserve these, uh, all these production lines and, and, and so on. No, no, no. Um, so that's the world of these, these huge, uh, huge organizations that really organize the supply chain. Um, and, and, and most of them are not great at manufacturing, you know. Um, their, their quality, if the buyer is not spending a lot of time and energy and engineering resources to really get things uh, straight, um, their quality is not amazing. Uh, you know, the, there are issues and sometimes they, they cheat on some of the components and so on. So it's not like paradise. However, um, they are great at organizing the supply chain and, um, you know, really, how to say, uh, making the best of the big volumes that they are getting from their customers. And they have a lot of weight uh, over the, the component suppliers, and they can they can negotiate good deals, and they can you know they orchestrate all of that to to um, to minimize the chances that some of the the, the parts or the the materials will, will not be ready on time, you know, and they they have relatively sophisticated planning systems in place for that, and and so on and so forth. So um, <clears throat> that's something that you can look into if you are you know a big buyer you know so um, there's a lot of talk about um, the big electronics uh, guys you know the the amazons and the hps and the apple of course and 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 so on um, because it is um, how to say it's really like this industry of contract manufacturers and and you you kind of get to know, oh, okay, so who's making the Surface uh, computers of Microsoft? Oh, it's in, uh, in, in Pegatron, in Sujo. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, mm. I've been there, you know, it's, there's 40,000 people there on the site. I don't know now, but at the time, I don't know, six years ago. Um, great, you know, and, and Pegatron is a pretty good company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, better at manufacturing than, than, um, than mo most of the competitors. But um, again, if I'm a small buyer, what, what, what can I take away from that? Not much. If I'm a small buyer, I, I, I'm not going to go in and say, well, you know, we have this, this product that's like half developed, but we need a lot of your help of your engineering resources to do that. And, and um, you know, you, um, you already have all the, all the suppliers ready to, to go for that. So you just tell us which ones are a good fit and you know, help us negotiate good pricing and 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 um, and by the way, this and these parts, uh, we already know uh, who is going to make them, and you, you're going to have to orchestrate all that and and uh, develop the new product and manage all the tooling and so on, and you're going to have to sign this crazy contract and so, you know, and 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 we can come anytime and you have to do all of these things for us. No, no, small buyers have to look for much smaller companies mm. and the resources are really not the same. <laughs> Let's say it uh, this way. And uh, the, the patience also is really not the same. If you develop your own new products, <clears throat> um, you know, you, you, you can just have them work on really complicated things for, um, uh, for, for six months or one year. I mean, uh, after a while, you just say, ah, oh, you know, finish, you know, next one, sorry, we, we, you know, we lost patience. There's just too many hurdles, too, too many complexities, um, right? So you, you got to forget about what you read in the press, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you've said before, even if you're a, a smaller company and you manage to get one of these large contract manufacturers to take mm -hmm. on your project, you might not even get the best possible service from them in comparison to a smaller CM. Oh, for sure. Um, for sure, you would not, because mm. where are the best product managers going to be working? You know, on 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 the biggest uh, biggest projects, right? 
And when, I don't know, when Amazon says, oh, this new, whatever, generation of tablets, whatever, it's really urgent. And, you know, you sign this contract and you're running late and you're going to have a lot of penalties and whatever. Then, you know, all the, all the resources are put there, you know. Yeah. And, and we know uh, what's going to happen to your order. Well, yeah, right. Um, things are just going to get to a very, um, <laughs> very slow pace. It's mm-hmm. going to be uh, it's going to become very cold right away. <laughs> mm. Okay, so out of the uh, nine points, then, so we're on to number two. So, what's what's your second point? Mm. So, you can really reserve production capacity. So, again, let let's say you let's take another example. Let's say you you purchase garments, and you you know roughly what kind of garment you're going to make. Let's say it's always you know denim jeans. Now, you don't know exactly what the cut is going to be. You don't know exactly what the color is going to be because, of course, your designers will sort of decide at the last moment. Uh, and they don't really know for sure what, what is going to be next year. Uh, I mean, in, in what they will design next year. However, you know that you're gonna, you are going to buy that many you know, tons of gray fabric anyway. And you know that you're going to be making at least, um, you know, uh, at least 1 million um, pairs of trousers, you know. And Mm -hmm. that translates into, I don't know, whatever, you know, 15 uh, sewing lines uh, busy all the time, all year round, right? And maybe there's, 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 uh, maybe you have four seasons, you know, so it's maybe not, not exactly year round, but like with four small peaks. Okay, if you know that, you go to the really big guys and um, that have all these production lines and everything, and you tell them, hey, gonna reserve 15 production lines, da, 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 you know, with some flexibility, but for sure I can reserve. And same thing with the, um, the cotton supplier, you know, and the dyeing houses, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need this capacity for sure. And I can commit to it, right? Yeah. I, you know, we need to reserve it. <clears throat> well, that's um, that's amazing, <laughs> right? Uh, but as a small buyer, who's going to really believe in in, in, in what you say? If you say, well, I'm going to, for sure, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> to buy this next year, this much. Um, you got to explain a little bit, you know, how, how come you have such confidence in your markets? Uh, why, you know, um, are you sure about that? And how, how can you commit? And, you know, and what, what happens if you just disappear and we don't, we don't hear from you again, you know, because you don't have a reputation, you don't have anything like that. So it would be much harder to, to convince manufacturers to really, um, reserve you know a part of their their um their capacity really like you know things like you know this you know you have to reserve whatever you know 20 uh lathe cnc machines uh for two weeks you know that month you know well Mm -hmm. it means they cannot take large orders that that will um that will will um will make good use of these cnc machines they really have to trust your forecast you know are they really going to trust your forecast uh, six months in advance, one year in advance. <laughs> you know, you got to be good at explaining that. Okay. And number three, negotiating directly with large sub suppliers. So that's also a no no, right? So let's take my example of the, the previous point where you, you're going to make denim pants and you know you have to buy, you know, that, that woven uh, cotton fabric and you. You know where it's made, and, and and you can go and talk directly with the, the guys that, that make that. Well, that that's interesting. That's possible. Starting at a you know a certain point. In in um. Let, let let's take another example. You your product is made of plastic, okay, and you it's for a very specific uh, application, and you want a specific very specific kind of polymer. Well, let's say you do all of your reliability testing and everything with a certain polymer from Chime, for example, 
or from DuPont or mm -hmm. BASF. Um, do you think you're going to be able to buy it directly from um, from DuPont or, yeah. or, or Chime or BASF? You know, um, or are you going to just buy what's available on stock in their authorized distributors? Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Mm. Um, and same thing also that very common case people ask us what about the batteries yeah can i just buy samsung or sony or panasonic batteries from them uh no <laughs> mm -hmm. they're probably not even going to want to talk to you but they have authorized distributors you're going to have to deal with with these guys and of course you have to trust that these authorized distributors are going to sell the sell you the the the, the real stuff right um now if you're a very big buyer and 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 you buy the same kind of whatever nylon uh, for you know for um, for for 20 of your products and these 20 products are made in um, in five different um, manufacturing places, well you can actually sort of pull everything together and go to say Chime. So it's it's a big um, big Taiwanese um, plastic uh, supplier. Yes. And you can say, hey, um, all together we buy that much plastic. You know, if we make you the, the directed supplier, we'll buy everything from you. But you know, you gotta give us some good terms and some good pricing and da 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 da. Well, if you're a pretty big supplier, that um, I mean buyer, that can work. Um, a lot of examples like that. I mean the. Sure. Um, yeah, even big companies. So I remember I was talking with someone from Valeo. Valeo makes a lot of um, automotive parts, mm -hmm. um, and it's not a small company. You know, they they <laughs> they 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 they're pretty pretty large. Yeah, uh, I've heard of them. Yeah, but they 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 themselves feel very small when buying certain kinds of uh, of, of components. Sure. And um, yeah, they were pretty frustrated sometimes. Yeah, this kind of specific plastic, you know, it's very hard to to reserve all the right capacity because uh, at the time it was, you know, because the iPhone six is 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 grabbing so much of it, <sighs> and that's it. You know, we can't. Mm. We have to come after Apple. <laughs> Apple already made the deal, um, and we we come after that, right? That, uh, um, a lot of stories like that. Mm, no, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So on to number four. Right. So um, you deal with um, with your suppliers, and you're gonna ask them to um, to to give you some information. You 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 want to understand their cost structure. Otherwise, it's too easy for them to say, oh, well, you know, the cost has to go up 10% this year. Why? Ah, uh, because you know the mm. wages are going up, and the taxes are going up, and blah 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 blah. By how much? What does it represent exactly? Blah blah blah. And you never get to an answer because they say, well, you know, oh, and we don't really make a profit on this, and it's not really interesting, and <laughs> and they never, they don't want to tell you, um, okay, how many, uh, how many people work exactly on my production, or how many minutes does it consume? How much do you pay your people and things like that? It just doesn't happen uh, if you are not a very big buyer. However, um, big buyers uh, will be able from the start to negotiate, you know, through their contracts and all their requirements. You know, you just give us all the information. You don't want? Fine. We don't select you. We just go somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, and so they have um, long forms to fill out, um, <clears throat> and and you know, and you have to say, okay, and we use that many square meters of space for production, and that much for warehouse, and da da da. And this is what we pay. Uh, yeah, we rent, and and we pay whatever 25 RMB per square meter, and we do this, and we do that. And the staff working there, they are paid that much plus this much in social security and blah blah blah, right? So they can, they can, they can do their little model, 
um, and sometimes it can be pretty pretty nasty. You know, they, they, they will go there and say, well, uh, based on what we see, you could reorganize things and you could consume half of the space that you're using and you're using 30% too much labor. We're not paying for it, you know. So cut the price accordingly. Clack. Mm. Um, you know, welcome to the, the, the auto industry, for example. <laughs> right? But uh, small buyers don't want that. Uh, small, sorry, suppliers don't want that. And they, not, mm. and they know that it's very, very uncommon for a small buyer to get that kind of visibility. So it just doesn't happen. Mm. So how, how would you say to get some level of visibility if you are in the smaller bracket? Well, um, at least you need to do a little bit of market research yourself to understand the price of the inputs to your production. You know, the at least the key material or two or three materials that they buy or components. Yep. You need to have an idea about that. Um, you need to have an idea also about the, 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 the wages in that area for that kind of production. Now it's, it can be a bit tricky. Like for example, um, so our, our little manufacturing facility is in Dongguan. And I was talking with a friend of mine. Uh, he works in a company that also has a manufacturing facility in, uh, in Dongguan, but they mm -hmm. make kitchenware. And well, their boss is, you know, a little bit uh, tight, <laughs> tight fitted, tight fisted, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> always paying the, the, you know, as little as he can. And then, so he was asking me, so how much you pay per, you know, per, per hour? And when I told him, it was like, wow, you know, we pay 30% more. How come? Well, yeah, I mean, most of what we do is electronics. Um, we have to, to hire people who, who've been trained to that and who know how to do it well. Oh, okay. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and we want, you know, just want good people. Well, you know, that's a 30 to 35% difference already in, in hourly cost. Full, to, totally fully loaded, right? Um, so it's not just a matter of, oh, they're in Dongguan, so they pay their staff, you know, 6,000 RMB or 7,000 RMB. Or, no, no, no. That's, mm -hmm. you, you get to know about the industry also. You get to know about the industry. So these are the mm -hmm. little things that you can do just by collecting a little bit of information. Um, and some, uh, some suppliers might be okay to give you like a formula as a basis for the pricing. Uh, that's what we do. I mean, we that's what we do. We say that's how many that many minutes, and that's the price per per hour for operators. And oh, and that much, you know, that that many whatever hours or minutes of um, inspection work and uh, in inspection work is billed at that much per hour. Well, that mm. you know. I think a lot of suppliers could, could do that, but the problem is they don't want because um, uh, because they want to be able to charge as much as they can. And when they think, oh, this guy, uh, we can charge more, they will charge more. And, and oh, this product, well, this product, we can charge more than that one for the same buyer. You know, they will, you, they will often play games like that. Mm. Uh, a lot of smokes and mirrors. So Yeah. So, so assuming assuming your supplier isn't as transparent as we try to be, in this case, doing your homework literally is is worth money to you uh, if, if you've oh. got that information to make sure that you're trying to keep them as accountable as possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. I mean, it's then you can fight back when they say, mm. oh, price goes up 15%. Okay, but <laughs> based on my information, you know, um, this, you know, this is how much the materials have gone up. Uh, actually, this material here has gone down. Uh, the, you know, the wages yeah. in your area, from what I see, have gone up this much since last year. So give me your calculations because, I, you know, I, I don't find the same results as you. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Fighting back. Uh, that, that, makes, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense in this context. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So on to point four. Five, and this is also about where we're trying to uh, maybe enforce something on the factory. So that's that's forcing a factory to use your own ERP system. Right. Uh, so very big buyers 
want their suppliers to feed information back into their own ERP system, you know, so they can track the, the progress of production, they can track a lot of things, and then they can use it to analyze, they can use it to, um, to know also when there's going to be a delay, um, to have some reassurance about how much inventory is, is coming to them soon and so on. Well, uh, first, small buyers often do not even have an ERP. And if they tell the supplier, hey, you have to input all this information here in my system, well, there's always a little bit of resistance, you know. So it's got mm -hmm. to be extremely simple. Um, I have a client recently that um, invited with Microsoft, uh, what is it, NAV? Yeah. They invited their suppliers and they made it very, very simple just to input this, or to request inspection and this, to request shipment and, and this, to say when they're going to be late. And and um, oh, and also when they accept the order. Yeah, there's like four four touch points. Um, kept it very, very simple. We went them, gave some training to the suppliers. Most of them said okay, uh, because, you know, there was a... Um, uh, it was give and take. They could have um, faster payments and things like that. So the buyer did give something in return, right? But that that's like the exception. Most of the case, it's not. It's not like that. It's really not not easy to get the suppliers to really, um, you know, uh, input information directly into your ERP. Mm, okay. And number six. Hmm. Well. Payment terms, you know, open account payment terms. Um, it's like open bar. It's whatever you like when you want, you know. And uh, yeah. so, uh, basically, it means that the suppliers just, um, you know, they have a contract with the buyer and they, they ship out. They don't get paid anything, um, and you know, they get paid 30 days after, or 60 days after, or sometimes 90 days after. Very big buyers can get away with a lot of things like that, mm. and um, and 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 that's just not going to happen for a small buyer. I, I I don't you know it's just, I think it's pretty obvious to anybody that's that's been buying something in China. What what is usually considered more or less standard is thirty percent down before uh, production starts and. 70%, uh, the payment of the remaining 70%, mm, at least after final inspection, if possible, after shipment, yeah. right? Um, and then once the supplier gets that, they can sh they can send the bill of lading and everything that will be used to uh, to get the goods back. But that, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, it's very hard often to, to negotiate for better payment terms. Hmm. And number seven, it's the product warranty and liability from the supplier. Huh. Well, if if you if you buy, especially ODM, so uh, um, a product that already exists, you find on Alibaba, Global Sources, something. You say, oh yeah, I like this one. Just uh, put it in my packaging like this, and um, I'll I'll be like basically your distributor. Um, under my brand, but still it's your product. Well, if you come back to them and say, hey, um, I have, you know, 5% um, uh, returns and it cost me that much and it wiped out, wiped out all my margin and, I'm, you know, this is really not working. Here's the bill. Um, you got to give me 20,000 bucks to, uh, to compensate for that for the, the previous order. Mm. Well, the supplier is going to say nothing. Just yeah, not going to reply. That. You're gonna say bye bye, you know. Next buyer. <laughs> um, however, however, uh, very big companies will negotiate all of this in advance, but large buyers also, sorry, large suppliers, will usually be aware of that. They will ask the right questions to understand. Okay, what's the, you know. Um, if there's that many defective, you know, what, what's going to be the impact, the business impact, and how much is going to cost, and so on. And if the buyer says yes, yes, and we'll reinvoice all of that to you because you have to, uh, you, you know, uh, you have to, to cover us for that, um, 
well, at least if it's manufacturing defects, of course, not if it's design defects, mm -hmm. um, then the, um, the manufacturer is going to pad their pricing and yeah. they're going to talk with the buyer about that and they're going to try to maybe um, spend a little bit more time getting the product design and the process design um, to the point where most of the issues are avoided or detected and caught and reworked mm. uh, because both of them are going to suffer if there's, you know, 3% defectives or 5% defectives, it might be a disaster. So they have to um, they have to think about that and plan accordingly. Yeah. But right. And so for the, the smaller organization, inspections, oh, yeah. inspections, critical. Yes, exactly. Do an inspection. If it's not good, stop it in the factory, have it re reworked in the factory and don't let them ship it out. Yeah. yeah. Because after that, it's like, it's over. <laughs> okay. And uh, number eight, shaping the supply chain physically. Hmm. So over the past, what, three years since Trump put his tariffs in place and everybody mm. kind of got afraid, we've heard of these big groups that say, oh, yeah, and we relocated production to Vietnam and we relocated production to whatever, Mexico or Eastern Europe or something. And very often they actually, um, they're still subcontracting production, but they, uh, they're doing, they moved assembly, or should I say they forced their assembly supplier to move the assembly operations out of China. Yeah. You know, um, there's been a lot of that, especially to Vietnam, because it's so convenient to, to keep the same component sources and just send them uh, by truck um just over the border right yeah so, we spoke about that before northern vietnam and it's right, literally right. just on the border with china yeah yeah right 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 so small buyers can really tell that their supplier you know hey um, you know how about you move to vietnam and yeah. uh, Cambodia, whatever and you know and that the buyer is going to be uh-huh okay well if 10 other customers tell me that you know i'll consider <laughs> right so I mean, if you've got if you've got a reason to want to move some of your supply chain to another country, but you're in a smaller league, then really it's just a case of trying to do the sourcing there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Mm, okay. And finally, number nine, which is uh, the ability to have your own teams on site all of the time. <laughs> I think it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Yeah. Uh, if you are. Um, in Shenzhen, I get to know a bunch of people, you know, from um, from Apple, uh, and they, they had an office in uh, let let me see, just next to the Central Walk over there, the, in the Cambridge, oh yeah, I think, yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> and they um, well, why do they have an office there with people traveling all over China, you know, the different manufacturing sites and everything? Well, they have a lot of production there, so it's actually not that expensive to Apple to have all these people there to, you know, the manufacturing um, specialists and the design engineers and the, 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 the supply chain security specialists and so on and so forth. They don't, you know, it doesn't cost that much to Apple. But if you buy a million euros a year from China from, you know, a couple of suppliers, you, you can't have a team following up on everything it, it just doesn't work hmm. it doesn't work no. it's the economics right and so in this case of course outsource this kind of thing to people who are already in situ in china or asia yeah yeah that's why there's a lot of companies like ours i mean we're not the yeah. only ones absolutely so if you can't you know have your own team there uh, but you still need the the the, the help the support uh, on the ground well you 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 know, you get to, to look for um, service providers that can help. Yeah. Absolutely. Sophies.com. <laughs> Just uh, one of the <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for filling us in on those, Renaud. Those are uh, a number of the uh, tasks, activities that smaller organizations are going to struggle with in comparison to, you know, the huge ones like the apples of this world that, that you've mentioned. Hopefully very enlightening for the listeners. So uh, thanks for joining me today. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. All right, thank you. Talk to you next time. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, 
don't forget to like and share and you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify and all other places that you get your podcasts from see you next time